Okay, um, apologies for the rather poor video quality. I've had to switch to my phone. Okay, uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, understanding Chennai's master plan and for particularly from a transport perspective. Uh, my name is Sumana. I am with CAG, Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group, where I head the work on road safety and sustainable mobility. So today, uh, so uh, let me first say a few words about CAG. So we're a 36 year old organization, uh, a nonprofit, we're based out of Chennai, and we work on a number of issues, um, starting, like I said, with road safety and sustainable mobility for one, but also on consumer rights, uh, on uh, solid waste management, where we work with the Chennai Corporation for a while. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of work on several environmental issues, such as EIA, particularly in uh, focusing on, uh, you know, getting information out to the public so that they understand the processes involved and uh, they're part of, uh, you know, they can give inputs on these very crucial things that affect their life. Um, so, uh, like I said, we work on a number of these areas and I work around uh, the transport related teams. And so today with, uh, you know, the third master plan coming up and, uh, you know, a lot of discussions in the government underway and they're looking at consultants and, you know, there's uh, a lot of on and off media coverage on this topic. Uh, we figured that this is a great time to talk about the master plan, why it's important and uh, what it means to us and why we as citizens need to be part of this conversation. Uh, because this is how our city is getting shaped and we need to uh, not only understand what it's about, but also have ensure that our voices are heard. So to that end, we've got uh, two eminent speakers here to set the context and the stage for us. Uh, first, we have Professor Srivatsan, who heads the Center for Research on Architecture and Urbanism at SEPT University. He has more than 25 years of experience uh, in teaching, uh, architectural and developmental research, and is also a practicing architect. He was also a senior deputy editor at the Hindu and, and a faculty at the School of Architecture and Planning at Anna University. So some of the research projects that he's, he was a part of are uh, re-envisioning the city, a research project uh, uh, funded by the Indo-Dutch program on alternatives and development, Mega Cities project, and Humpy, the Indian Digital Heritage Research Project. He's also been published in a number of journals and books as well. So uh, clearly a man of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of experience and knowledge, and we're really glad to have him here with us. Uh, Professor Srivatsan, welcome, and thank you for agreeing to join us. And Thanks. without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, with CAG and uh, everyone uh, who have come to find out what's happening on the master plan front. Uh, in recent days, uh, we, we, we are hearing more and more about uh, the forthcoming third master plan. And today, the focus is on master plan and transportation. We have, uh, I'm also happy to be here with Aspati uh, from the ITDP and uh, uh, she, I am assuming, will speak extensively on transportation-related issue. While I have decided today uh, to share my views on uh, what have been the planning of, uh, attempts so far uh, for the last 100 years, particularly the last 60 years, and uh, probably look at some of the uh, issues uh, that besiege the uh, planning and some simple framework for uh, going forward. So I will not uh, focus e exclusively on transport, but I would like to set the larger context in place. Uh, so let me share, I have a short presentation. Let me share my Okay. Now, so I hope you can see my presentation here. So, uh, Basically, I've just got four parts to put. One, 
what the current state is, what is uh, the fact and figures of the city as of now, and what have been the various plans and limitations. The third one is what kind of a framework we can have for plans and projects. And here, I'm trying to pitch, bring in this debate between plans and projects, and finally wrap it up with uh, some ideas for way forward. Now, here is the basic numbers that we probably have to bear in mind. One, uh, the population in terms of population uh, going by the uh, recent uh, UN prospects. So we have 10 million in the urban agglomeration, which basically includes uh, Chennai district, parts of the Thiruvalluvar, Kanjipuram, and Chengalpet district. And uh, it's currently, uh, in 2018, it was 10.4, and it's projected to reach about 13.8 maybe about 14 or 15 million. So essentially we are looking at the urban agglomeration, which is growing steadily. And second, in terms of the size of the city, the city corporation is about 426 and the current metropolitan area is about 1,189. Uh, in this map, you could see that uh, indicated by the red line, that's the uh, metropolitan area and the 426 is uh, the city limits. And the proposed expansion of CMA, which is currently under discussion, uh, whether to go as uh, far as, uh, as as large as 6,000 or it should it be 8,000. Uh, in terms of distance from the city center, so we are looking at the limits of the metropolitan at 30 kilometers. If it is 60, and if you are looking at an 8,000 square kilometer expansion, you would look at it as 75 to 80 kilometer. Uh, uh, sort of radius of the city. Of course, it's not a perfect semicircle of sort. Uh, you could see it's a, it's a kind of an approximation that I've tried to indicate. So it's growing on the west, it's growing on the southwest, and it's growing on the south, not so much on the north. Uh, so the another number to be kept in mind are, is the density. So the city is fairly dense. So you're talking about 247 persons per hectare. I mean, this was the number when it was about 172. Current numbers I don't have when it has spread to 426, but nevertheless, it's one of the densest cities in this country. It doesn't appear because they're not many multi-story, but it's fairly dense. And this is expected to go to 330 persons. In a set, what this means is the city is going to get a lot more dense than what we are. And uh, it's completely understandable because most of the buildings, uh, uh, till about a decade ago was ground or groundless two with fairly about a ground and a two ground property size, which are all being redeveloped. So the city is sort of redeveloping itself uh, and the density is going to raise. And the same area uh, in comparison is only about one fourth or one fifth of the density. And even um, uh, if the growth rate is spill over, which it will, so the density is only is about 205. So basically this CMA would still be sparse uh, while the city will be super dense. Now, uh, the city has been growing steadily. Uh, you can ignore the third column. I think it's, a, it's, not, it's not so correct, but let's not worry about it. So the city is steadily growing. So we are talking about a city which for the next two decades, we are not uh, looking at something which is going to slow down or stop. Of course, there's going to be a difference between the rate of growth within the city and the rate of growth outside the city limits in the CMA, and we'll come to it in a moment. But also an equally an important fact is this. Chennai is a city of its kind. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a megapolis. While all the other towns, if you see the population difference, uh, between the uh, urban agglomerations and even for that matter, the city, uh, you could still see uh, there's a huge difference between Chennai and the rest of the cities. But currently, if you see most of the uh, planning approaches and rules, uh, particularly the common building rules, treats the entire state as something which is flat, but the figures on the ground shows that they are very different. And uh, the primary status of Chennai for long will remain the same, though we may have been talking about tier two, tier three cities. Uh, investment in Chennai is continuously increasing. 
So here is another statistics from Oxford Economics. You would see again, though Chennai's rate of growth in percentage terms is on the ninth of the top 10 cities in India. Uh, take a look at the absolute terms, absolute numbers. So you have a, a phenomenally uh, a, a huge gap between Chennai and the other uh, cities such as Tirupur or Tuchinapuri. And uh, what it means is uh, from the current uh, GDP to the uh, next two decades of growth, uh, the investments are going to go uh, higher and more money is going to be invested in the city, which means uh, as Alan Berto uh, sort of uh, defined the city, the city is a function of jobs. So if the investments are going to increase in three folds, uh, which is going to produce, uh, if not proportionately large, job, large number of jobs, but substantial number of jobs, uh, the property prices, the city expansion and so on is going to only increase. Now that's the current status and what, should, what could happen in the next 10 or 20 years. So this uh, city is not, was planned not only in 1975, as we often try to say the first master plan was in 1975 and the second master plan in 2008, but it has a long history of planning. If we were to start 1918 or 1920, when the first town planning act was passed, of course, uh, 1915 was in Bombay and subsequently in, um, in, in, in Madras in 1920. So we have the first planning effort in 1919. The first, actually the master plan comes in 1959 um, uh, with the help of uh, the Yale University. Uh, and then there are a series of plans. The characteristics of these plans from 1918 at, or at least from 1948 to 1975 has been primarily to control growth. There's a lot of hope and imagination that the growth of the city can be curtailed and the increasing population could be distributed uh, to the satellite towns on urban nodes on the peripheries. And that's why places like Maramela Nagar, Tiramisai, Manali and all that were planned and uh, in the hope that the population coming inside the city would be controlled. But that actually uh, never happened and cannot happen since the investment in the city is increasing and uh, the uh, satellite towns have the kind of social infrastructure and the transport infrastructure for it to be uh, the magnet. In the 1980s and 1945, in the 1980s, there were even some debates about having urban agriculture, creating urban nodes, uh, compacting the city, et cetera, but they didn't really find its place. Uh, in 1995, it was almost like uh, hands off planning. So in fact, uh, the most uh, popular then uh, was the, what you call the minimum intervention planning, basically no land use, et cetera, uh, based on the road width, you can possibly have any kind of development that you chose to. Uh, while the 2008 is a mishmash of many things, uh, it's primarily uh, by the time a lot of uh, development projects have come into the city, like Metro was already in the planning, uh, the IIT corridors were planned, something which uh, not even the 1995, which was about to plan, didn't even envisage, there was no clue about a tremendous change in the economy and the kind of service industry that would flourish in the city. The 2008 was primarily trying to make sense of what it was, what was happening outside the plan and try to put it, uh, give it a kind of a framework. It didn't have a very strong um, planning objective as that of 1975. And it's also the time when uh, increasingly post 95, you see private sector investment in housing, private sector led economic growth, uh, and I think 2008 was, it was uh, primarily trying to make sense of what was happening. Now, the, despite many of the planning objectives uh, with great intentions, good intentions, uh, most of it weren't realized, couldn't be realized, primarily because plans in my view, basically look city as a closed system, but actually city is an open-ended and dynamic. 
it seems to have its own mind, a life of its own. Uh, and uh, the plan primarily tries to regulate and it doesn't have the flexibility. It views the city as a kind of a very static spatial organization. More importantly, plans lay out a lot of ideas, but there's hardly any commensurate investment. Let me just quickly illustrate my point here. Uh, you see the land use planning has uh, substantially failed. For example, uh, the plan projected that uh, the uh, build-up area expansion will be controlled. The land reduction in agriculture would be minimum. Open space would increase. But none of them have actually happened. Actual reduction in agricultural land has been twice almost. Uh, open space is substantially reduced. Land use conversions have been phenomenal. So the land use planning primarily did not really work well because the market is dynamic. Uh, there's a lot of projects that come outside the purview of the plan. And uh, it's always very difficult to uh, sort of uh, review the master plan because the horizon years are about 20 years, 15 years, et cetera. But the most important fact was, I think Chennai is one of the cities which has uh, inefficient land use utilize, land utilization, because for example, its spatial growth rate in a decade is almost 1.5 times more than the population growth, which means the urban footprint is increasing higher than the population growth rate, which is in a sense an indication of the sprawl. And if you look at this, uh, a very good study uh, done by World Bank in 2007 on the density, you see the density gradient, uh, you know, phenomenally dropping down uh, after a certain distance, and that still holds true. I'll come to that in a moment. Second, we have not done enough on affordable housing because affordable housing, we are not defined in terms of uh, a price to income ratio. We relied heavily on uh, land use and zoning incentives and private sector. Uh, and we have to bear in mind, Chennai is not a really a rich city in a sense, uh, you see the median income, average early household income is roughly in the order of 3.5 lakhs, which means 50% of the household live below 3.5. And if you use a price to income ratio of four or even five for that matter, any house less than 20 to 22 lakhs is not affordable for 50% of the sector. And private sector will not produce housing units below 20 sector, and they have all the reasons not to do so. While the uh, while the the state has uh, been uh, sort of uh, withdrawing itself from a provider to an enabler, so now this has led to a lot of debate uh, internally whether we should go the plan route or the project route because since plans are uh, while people who support the plan route they know state still as the initiator as the arbitrator provider. Plans look at longer vision, there's a longer horizon, uh, it, it regulates development. While the projects are looking basically as actionable elements, it's seen as building blocks. Uh, and that's a way to go forward and it's problem solving. But in my view, uh, we should have a, a sort of a realistic assessment of what the plans can do and what it cannot do. The plans cannot completely plan the city, it cannot project and provide. In my view, it can do six clear things. It can create a road network. It can focus on mobility, provide open spaces, pr protect environmental features, uh, provide social housing, and enable better service. And there are a few other things that should be done outside the plan because the plan itself does not ensure a good city. Uh, so what we need is a middle bridge. We need a framework. And we also need a series of projects. And not every project can be counted as a public project. So there are features of these projects which qualify as uh, projects for people and which should probably create places for people and so on and so forth. And I wouldn't go into details of this, but I would probably based on this, I have some 15 principles which I think Chennai's uh, future uh, planning would require. First, it has to reimagine its city, regions, and so on and so forth. I'll explain some of them in the subsequent uh, slides. For example, if you use the current advisory from the UN Habitat, you cannot imagine a city as a fixed region because there are a lot of urban clusters uh, around the city. There is a large commuting zone around the city. 
so the functional area of the city has to be an inclusion of the city and its functional regions uh, where people live and commute because of housing, uh, people are priced out of the city for housing. So I just tried to do <clears throat> as to what are the growth centers, which are the uh, centers of jobs, where are the houses affordable and how where people live and commute. If you see, this is what you get, a si kind of a, a, a sort of a trapezium of sort, uh, which if you want to do a production edge will probably roughly take you about seven hours and about 284 kilometers long. And if you sort of abstract it, this is what you're getting. So the city is a solid, dense entity, but the jobs are available are outside. The land is relatively cheaper, not so cheap, but relatively cheaper because even as far as Gudwanjari uh, or Waraganam, you have to pay about 4,000 to 3,500 rupees per square foot. It's not real cheap, cheap. So it's the case of Chengalpet or for that matter, even Ganjipura. Uh, so this is the larger functional zone. So, so we cannot imagine the city as a static entity, we'll have to imagine the city and its city regions, whether it should be 6,000 or not is not the point. It's the question is the logic of the relationship between the city and its interlands. And it doesn't have to be imagined as a contiguous area. So we can look at clusters and we look at polycentric cities. Um, and one of the problems here is the question of densities and compactness. So I just took a, a two, kilo, a, a two by four square kilometer, uh, two by four uh, kilometer stretch, and analyzed for its uh, development as of now, you can find about uh, 48, 50 percent are underdeveloped. So the development is all arcing along the roads because there is not enough uh, ro uh, road network. So what's happening is uh, the the the, the Senna city is becoming like a badly cooked pizza. The crest is overburnt, the sogginess inside. So it's absolutely unsustainable and inefficient. And the numbers also show us that. So there is a, a sort of a very inadequate road line. And particularly if you were to look at number of bus routes, this only covers the corporation. I don't have information about uh, the kind of bus routes, both in the current metropolitan area and the and, and, and the projected metropolitan area. Without grid of roads, not only mobility, we are not going to get service plots. And if you don't have service lands, then the apartments are going to be expensive and we have to rely on large, huge projects. Self-help, small houses, small plots are going to be very difficult to get. Now, the other one is we see the light, uh, night light data, the Chennai to Pondicherry, the entire coast, is almost uh, getting built up, except for the small pocket around Kalpakum, the, the, the nuclear authority restricts control. So it's virtually it's built up and also physically built up. While we know from a climate change perspective and the raise of sea level, about uh, a kilometer and more than that from the coast is going to be severely affected. So how do we deal with the precarious coastal zone as we go forward? And uh, there are some new ideas, which I think we have not yet tried, for example, performance ideas of how you see the ecology of the city in terms of patches, corridors, and matrix, create what is called a non-urbanizable or a controlled and regulated uh, matrix of the uh, city, and uh, sort of uh, keep it low density, and ensure that the environmental assets are protected, and so on, is something that we have to look forward to as we go. I want to end up here by uh, uh, looking at the 15 things that we need to do. And I think one, the city's growth will not be contained, cannot be controlled. The investments are coming in, in very large numbers. The population will raise. But the question is, how do we compactly develop? How do we have a meaningful plan for the suburbs whose density is uh, almost one third of the city's density. And you can see the land utilization, the utilization has been poor, inefficient. So how do we plan for the suburbs? How do we plan for the peri-urban areas? This is one of the, second is we don't have to look out as a as a one large Mahmoud uh, contiguous city. We can look at a series of polycentric cities or cluster of cities. We require a grid of roads which will lead us for a compact development. And that's the way in which we can even prioritize public transport. 
And uh, if we were to look at it as a polycentric and cluster of cities, there is always scope to do urban agriculture. And, and in this case, we have to create certain ecological corridors and patches. And the coastal area has to be dealt as a separate environmental zone. Uh, we also need very strong interventions in demarcating affordable housing. Otherwise, constantly people will be priced out. The commuting cost, transportation cost is going to be very high. Uh, the trip lengths will be higher. The time taken to travel from place of work to place of living is going to be also long. And I think we also simultaneously need 20 key urban design projects whose uh, time horizon is five years. And we would see uh, the areas around key uh, public spaces uh, developed. Uh, private sector incentives are needed in terms of supplying housing, but they cannot be uh, unregulated. It has to be tied to the deliverables. We also clearly need metrics and targets so that we know that we are progressing uh, in, a, in the right direction. More importantly, the data on which, uh, on what basis that we take decisions have to be made public and amended uh, the progress and the plan process uh, should be made open uh, in terms of reviews and consultation. So I'll just stop here. And uh, I know I've not dealt specifically with transport, but I thought my idea is to set the larger context, what the state is currently, and what would be our future. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. So thank you for giving that uh, background overview and a sense of uh, where our planning mechanism has started and where we are at today and and uh, pointing out that uh, you know the pros and cons of how we've been doing this and also uh, what we should actually be uh, potentially looking at uh, to ensure our, this city uh, you know grows in a better way and gives us what we want. Uh, Subramani, could you just make sure that everybody else is muted? Thank you. So um, I will uh, hand, uh, you know, uh, let's let's have the other speaker as well, and then we will throw it open for both questions and comments from the participants. So um, the second speaker today is uh, Ashwati Dilip. She is the South Asia Director of ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, and is a a well-known expert in the areas of public transportation, e-mobility, uh, you know, uh, street design and planning of, uh, you know, uh, very inclusive uh, streets, and of course, travel demand, travel demand management. She has uh, been working with national, state, and city governments across India to provide policy and technical assistance on sustainable, equitable, and inclusive urban mobility. Uh, ITDP, uh, Ashwati and uh, the ITDP team are now uh, working with not just Chennai City, but also with the central government on various projects and campaigns on call, you know, uh, around these areas of walking, cycling, and public transportation. Uh, some of the uh, well-known ones in the past couple of years have been India Cycles for Change, Transport for All Challenge, Streets for People, and uh, these are in partnership with both the Smart Cities mission of the ministry and, of course, uh, local urban bodies like the Chennai Corporation. So welcome, Ashwati. Uh, thank you for agreeing to speak on this subject. And over to you. Thank you, Sumana and CAG for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you as well as uh, with uh, Mr. Sri Watson. And it was great hearing him speak, setting the context. And uh, I'm just going to share um, a, a small slideshow, which talks about uh, sustainable mobility vision for Chennai. So let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen, Sumana? Yes, we can. Sure, thank you so much. So I'm just going to you know, very briefly talk about what is it that when it comes to urban mobility and sustainable urban mobility that we might want to see 
um, in Chennai for us to make sure that we're living in a, 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 a vibrant city which is not polluted and which is uh, not as congested as it is today. So let's hope and see whether this vision actually or this dream is something that we can aim for. So uh, um, when we talk about the sustainable urban mobility vision for all, we imagine that it's a city where there's transit near everyone to go everywhere on, on time. We believe that the city should have healthy streets where each one of us can lead healthy lives. And this is not just for a few uh, members of the society, but for all, for all our inclusive um, uh, citizens from whether they're children or women or even elderly. And last but not the least, can we aim to have congestion-free streets and can we aim to have pollution-free cities? So to just, you know, start with some context, uh, I'd like to just use the quote of Enrique Penlosa, who said that an advanced city is not one where even the poor use cars, but rather one where even the rich use public transportation. And this sort of a vision is also set, uh, you know, whether it is our second master plan or whether it is our Chennai and comprehensive, Chennai's comprehensive transportation study in 2010, there's always a grand vision that is laid out. So this vision, in fact, in 2010 had spoken about nearly doubling the public transport mode share cutting private transport by half and retaining walking and cycling mode share. A very similar sort of a um, vision set by the second master plan as well. Yet, when we look at what has actually happened in the last two decades, the reality is very, very different. Um, private motor vehicles have grown. Every year we have about 180,000 um, private motor vehicles that come onto our streets. Walking, cycling have fallen and public transportation has gotten hit the most. So it's not, not just the poor public transportation that we are actually um, you know, uh, being embraced by or we are, we are having to live with, but congestion is also costing Chennai a lot. If you took, take a look at all the different costs that we need to pay for this congestion, it almost costs us about 4,000 crores every year. The thing is, we as a city might have different modes of public transport. So we have suburban railways, we have MRTS, we have Metro now that we're introducing, and we have the public transport system as well. Yet with all of them being so disconnected from one another, where there is a lack of seamless integration, it has really seen an increase. The city has seen an increase in cars and motorcycles. So now just focusing on buses for a minute, it's, it's, it's great that our city is looking at improving or widening the metro system, but at the end from a rail system, you do need to reach your home and invariably there is a transfer to the buses as well. Now, here I'd like to highlight that buses tend to be 10 times more efficient, but unfortunately they're always stuck in congestion. Now, it's also unfortunate that Chennai's bus fleet has remained stagnant in the last decade, even though its population grew by 30%. And hence, there's an urgent need for us to increase our increase the number of, of buses that we have. But if you look at the map, and when you start looking at the, the master plan that will now uh, have a much wide, much greater area that it would cover, you'll notice that our that the peak, that the uh, population that can access our bus stop is um, is very less, and you can see that there are large deserts of public transportation even in our city as you move away from the core city. So only sixty percent of Chennai citizens have a bus stop available within ten minute walking uh, distance, and when it comes to frequent buses the figure actually drops to 53%. So four out of 10 citizens in the current city do not have access um, to buses. Now, it's not just about us ensuring that there is a nice uh, robust network of public transportation, but how are we going to access these, whether it is the metro or whether it is your suburban rail or your bus stops, 
often the access to these bus stops are a ordeal. And 85% of our bus stops in the city, according to a study, uh, shows that they are hard to be reached on foot. And as a result of all of these different things that have been sort of leading up to it, MTC's ridership has dropped by a third over the last decade. And of course, COVID has struck a massive blow. So despite being laid on the best transport routes, Chennai's Metro's ridership is about one seventh of initial projection. So the Metro definitely has a role to play. But what I'd like to highlight is that public transportation has a much, that is with a focus on buses, has a much more important role to play in our city. And it is the integration between the rail and the bus, which is very, very important for our city's progress. So let's just look quickly at what can be done and what could be done, in fact, by the master plan itself. So as I said, we'd like to have transit near everyone to go everywhere on time. So firstly, can we ensure that we have more buses and greener buses? Can we have faster and reliable buses? And can we have safe access to transit? So when it comes to buses, um, we need about 6,600 buses in Chennai to ensure public transportation for all. And when we do look at it, uh, when there is an opportunity, it, is, it would be very important for us to transition to cleaner fuels as well. Now, as we look at expanding our city, it also gives us an opportunity for us to think through the kind of road networks that we want to create for the future as well. So here is a great opportunity for us to make sure that where the metro or the suburban rail ends, if we can create street networks that prioritize bus lanes as well. Now, these can help in faster travel, which can help in reducing the travel time to as much as 20 to 30% during rush hours. It can increase ridership and revenue, and it is also quick to deploy when we can start thinking about right now for the next maybe 20 years. And lastly, it's very, very important for us, whether it's the metro station, suburban rail, et cetera, to look at safe access to transit and ensuring that you know, all of this is vibrant and well lit so that it's inclusive and safe for our citizens as well. Now, next, I'd like to focus into, as we just left out, that it's very, very important for us to look at how can we create healthy streets and healthy lives for all. And here, if I could just um, share a quote that the depth of democracy can only be shared by the, it can only be measured by the width of your footpath. So um, as we were going through the second master plan, and there were various projects that were identified in the master plan, including flyovers, elevated roads, um, subways, um, as well as footover bridges. And we noticed that only three roads were identified for the creation of footpaths. However, a master plan should make sure that streets across the entire city are safe for our pedestrians to use. So here, if I could just uh, share with you that Chennai roads, especially the highways, are deadly for pedestrians. And although similar in size, um, in Chennai, where there are, where there are about 1,252 people dying as a result of road crashes, in Paris, there's only about 34 people who are dying uh, in road crashes. And in comparison, just about one street, our OMR, kills as many pedestrians as all the road fatalities in Paris. So why are these fatalities happening? And there's just one simple reason, which is that speed kills. 56% of all our road fatalities in India are due to overspeeding. Now, if you can see this woman who's trying to cross in the middle, uh, that's because our highways are designed for speed and not for our citizens to be able to cross. And especially when you think about uh, vulnerable citizens like women and children, etc. So this, if I could give you the example of OMR, there are very regular footover bridges on the street. Yet over 90% of our uh, pedestrian fatalities occur when they try to cross the road because people are not interested in using the footover bridge. It is inconvenient for them and hence it's very important for us to look at what is the best solution for our citizens. 
So it comes to a question about how can we have a fairer distribution of road space? And just to give you some examples of the kind of project cities across the world have been embracing. Cities like Seoul demolished a six kilometer long elevated um, highway in order to create a waterfront uh, promenade and that too in just two years with very good connectivity to public transport. And it's not just in Seoul, but also cities like Paris have been transforming their arteries, which is already rather safe with very wide crossings into pedestrian uh, havens. And so, you know, sort of looking, that's a great inspiration for us to start with. And along with streets, people also need public spaces or open spaces. So New York, for example, has about 26.4 square kilometers of open space per person, which comes uh, when you compare it to Bangalore, Bangalore has about 17.32 square kilometers, whereas in Chennai, we only have about 0.81 square um, kilometers. So even though cities such as you know, New York and Chennai have similar population densities, New York actually has 33 times more open space. And I think the master plan gives us a great opportunity for us to rethink the amount of space that we could provide our citizens. So cities across the world are looking at reclaiming space um, from cars for people. And this is an example um, from Times Square. And this is an example from Pearl Street Plaza. So these are cities who with less than seven years have reclaimed um, you know, more than 180 acres of, space, uh, of street space for pedestrian plazas. And globally, cities are making walking and cycling a priority where Paris is tripling its biking trips. Now, Chennai has initiated, it has taken steps in the right st uh, direction with over 150 kilometers of streets transformed for making it safe for walking. Um, and Pondi Bazaar, which uh, was in the heart of the city, is one great example of how uh, we can create public spaces which prioritize pedestrians and prioritize all the different citizens, whether it's a toddler or an elderly as well but our city does have a long way to go. So eight out of 10 people in Chennai lack access to safe footpaths. And I believe that the master plan can be a great way of looking at the streets that need to be prioritized for improving this uh, safety. So what can we do? As we look towards creating healthy streets and healthy lives, can we have streets as healthy public spaces for all? Can we make sure that cycling is made safe and fun for all? Cycling that fell by more, almost as much as 15 to 20%, can we look at increasing its more share? And how can we make sure that no lives are lost to road crashes? So firstly, to you know, look into streets as healthy public spaces, can we look at creating about 100 public spaces by repurposing street space or creating new ones as the city expands into the new, uh, in newer areas? Can we also look at making cycling safe and fun? So we had examples of a city like Sevilla, which just in a matter of two years had created almost 80 kilomet uh, kilometers of um, safe, segregated cycle tracks. So as we are looking at um, this new master plan, looking at further areas, can we look at creating networks which are safe for walking and cycling as well? And lastly, can we look at eliminating maybe top 50 black spots by compacting the intersections and also looking at institutional restructuring in, in terms of or, or institutional strengthening by creating data and behavioral insights unit. Last uh, piece that I'd like to sort of focus on is also looking at what are some of these radical progressive measures that our city can embrace as well. How can we make sure that our streets are congestion free and pollution uh, free city as well? So it is unfair to have cities where parking is free for cities and housing is expensive for people, said Donald Shoup. And I think we, we heard um, Sri Watson talk about how housing is pretty expensive within our city as well. So just to you know, share some context, 
whenever we create new roads, whether it is new flyovers or widening of roads, more lanes generally tend to induce more traffic and more congestion. It does not solve it. And this was a clear example from Sydney that shared the same thing as well. And when we build flyovers, we in fact tend to aggravate congestion. So Delhi, for example, has 84 flyovers and congestion in Delhi remains as high as ever. Cities across the country, across the world, such as London and Singapore, etc., have been embracing road pricing. The, the whole concept is that you pay for using the road because you might be polluting more than um, a person who's using public transportation or walking or cycling. And for the purpose that you really need to use the your private vehicle for this journey, through the payment, you might also end up getting more um, congestion-free streets because only the people who most need to use private vehicle will then start using private vehicle. And in London, they noticed that this particular new initiative had reduced traffic congestion by as much as 30%. So here is a small illustration of how this works, but not going into that in detail. And um, the last piece is also to look at how the fact that we sometimes think we need more and more parking, but free and unregulated parking, in fact, chokes our streets. And um, if you do look at what we are currently charging for our parking, Chennai charges less than 2% of what London charges for its parking. So when we do price parking right, um, that's when we're able to reduce the parking demand. Um, so in London, it was noticed that when they doubled the parking fees, they reduced car usage by as much as 20%. And cities are now adopting parking maximums to reduce car usage, so especially if you have a um, project which is uh, very close to a metro station where you've invested crores or thousands of crores, then in order to um, nudge or encourage you to use public transportation, parking spaces are put to a maximum and not a minimum that we generally do see. And cities are now repurposing their parking to create public spaces because the parking is not being used as much, especially in their multi-level car parks. So former parking structures, we've seen them becoming offices, we've seen them becoming community centers, et cetera. And hence, we should be very careful before we go into creating any multi-level car parks. And parking revenue um, received by parking, uh, by pricing parking on streets can actually be invested to create better transport for all as well. Barcelona, for example, uses this revenue to provide um, <clears throat> op, uh, a bike cycle sharing system uh, free um, for its maintenance, etc. And London actually provides, uh, uses the parking revenue to fund free transit for elders and persons with disabilities. So again, just coming into what can be done for congestion-free streets and pollution-free cities, we could park it right as well as price it right. So firstly, we really need to manage parking on street before building MLCPs and keep in mind that the space that is required for a car park is the same as the space that is required for an economically weaker household to have an apartment as well. So would you like to use that space right in the heart of the city for providing housing for our vulnerable citizens or by using it for an MLCP. Well, um, Chennai is already on its way to adopt a parking policy and hence charging parking to regulate uh, demand would be the way it needs to go ahead and reinvesting the revenue that it does get to create healthy streets as well. Similarly, as we look at you know, what might be the progressive measures that we do want to take on um, when we have a span of the next um, two decades, maybe like, you know, could we look at how is it that we can make sure that we decongest our streets um, through pricing as well? So yeah, just summarizing them all, I've basically looked at that transportation to improve transportation in the city we need transit near everyone to go everywhere and on time. We need to ensure that our streets are healthy such that all of us lead and live healthy lives and, and make sure that it is um, healthy for everyone, including our children and our elderly. And how do we create congestion-free streets and pollution-free cities through embracing parking and pricing? So thank you so much and looking forward to the questions that might be coming ahead.
Sumana, we can't hear you in case you're talking. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself and it, it wasn't letting me. Thank you, Ashwati, for that. And I think that was, uh, you know, brought together all the points uh, very clearly and also uh, highlighted uh, what I think many of us will want out of this city and where we would want to go. And hopefully uh, this is what we will see in the coming years. So now I'll throw it open to the floor for people uh, if they have questions or even just inputs and comments on uh, you know, uh, what they think. Uh, and I'm gonna just throw a couple of questions out there for participants to also mull over and perhaps uh, talk about. So as citizens, like what do we want from the third master plan in terms of uh, transport? Uh, you know, what is the role that we can play individually and collectively? Uh, and, you know, uh, you might also want to look at what are the issues that you faced while commuting each of us? You know, what are the difficulties that we have? Uh, you know, what would make us uh, switch to walking, cycling and public transit? So where do we see the city going from here on forward? Especially in the context of, the, I think the last couple of years we've seen thanks to COVID and the lockdowns, uh, a lot of people taking to walking and cycling. So uh, is, you know, as individuals and collectively, where do we see our city and what would you like the city to look like? And therefore, what do we want out of the master plan? So I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, you can raise your hand um, or just comment in the box. Thank you. Uh, hi, I am Trupti. Uh, I am a resident of Bangalore and I have been working on public transport for now seven years. I just wanted to share a few experience of mine working with the Bangalore bus service and Bangalore metro service. So um, when we were working with BMTC, they had a fixed few routes which were actually not catering to any population, but they wanted to run the routes because they were running it uh, for quite a long time. So I think this is one attitude that um, should change and more public oriented routes have to be there so that people start using public transport. Uh, second thing was they were running metro feeders and the metro feeders were running over 12, 13 kilometers one way. So it was not actually serving the metro feeder purpose and people did not have uh, integrated uh, transportation available to reach the metro station. Uh, we had suggested them to have metro feeder routes to three to five kilometers, which was actually not accepted. Uh, working with BMRCL, we had uh, given them plans uh, for metro station integration. We had marked few spaces wherein we, they can uh, integrate the nearest bus stop, the nearest auto station, nearest cab uh, drop off pickup points. But then that was also not implemented. So my personally, I feel that uh, institutional integration plays a very uh, pivotal role when it comes to uh, integrating the complete transportation strategies because footpaths are done by someone else, metro stations are done by, done by someone else, pickup drop-offs are done by someone else, and BMTC runs its own route, like bus services, they run their own route. So uh, would you like to comment something on this aspect, like in institutional integration or some umbrella agency uh, has to play the role to bring all them together so that we actually have a good transport network. Uh, Tripti, would you want to direct that to one of the speakers specifically, or do you want to throw it open to both of them, whoever would want to reply? Because it is transport related, uh, maybe uh, Ashwati ma'am can answer, but uh, I mean, of course, sir can also put in his comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Srivatsan would also have his comments, but if I could just take that. So Tripti, I think you, you, you know, uh, point a very, very key concern that for our city to actually become sustainable with respect to transportation, it's not one agency's um, concern. It, it is basically bringing together multiple agencies from the metro to the bus, to the urban rail, to the um, MRTS, to, uh, you know, to getting traffic police on board, to making sure that CMD, you know, it, it's, it's bringing everybody together. And I think master plan has a role to play, but it's also the Chen Chennai's um, UMTA, the Urban Metropolitan Transport Authority, which would have a very, very important role to play. And currently with the UMTA being, uh, you know, sort of 
in like there, there is momentum in the Kumta front as well as we speak, and it is uh, managed by the Housing and Urban Development Secretary, under whom CMDA also comes. So um, I think we're in a point in time when the city is looking to create its second master plan and is also looking to set up this urban metropolitan transport authority as well and I, I'm an opportunist and I feel that we're in that right moment where with the right master plan and by making sure that all of these different departments have projects that work towards the same vision, we can slowly and steadily start bringing all of them together towards this vision. Srivatsan, if you had something to add over to you. Nothing specific except that uh, the transport plan and the uh, spatial plan needs to be integrated because the commute, commute has a character. You, know, you, you travel for some purpose. So, so where you live and where you work and uh, you know how you kind of integrate them is, is a key concern of the master plan. And I, I'm sure those will all be sort of brought up in the third master plan. Thank you, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and thank you, Tripti. So there's a couple of comments in the chat box. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly read those out. Uh, so from uh, Mr. Anandakrishnan, uh, he says uh, that uh, two developments have taken place. Urban areas have elected local bodies and uh, there are now new stakeholders. Chennai has a metropolitan planning committee greatly pushed by the high court. Uh, which should have two thirds elected representatives. Uh, the experience so far is that silo development has pushed special interests with housing development happening haphazardly. The investment in metro rail has led to value increase in some corridors with no plan for value capture share for the civic agencies. And parking is a major revenue source to subsidize pedestrians and public transport, but it has not happened again with vehicle users proving more influential. Where does this leave us? How can citizens pursue their interests collectively for sustainability, especially when the media is weak in its approach to these issues and is often influenced by special interests? On another note, COVID has severely hit public confidence in public transport, especially where supply bottlenecks can create crowding. Uh, Ashwati or uh, Professor Srivatsan, do you want to comment on any of that? Um, uh, good to see Anantya, uh, uh, who's been uh, very closely following and writing on uh, various urban issues. Uh, certainly, the, I think that one of the key differences between second plan and the third plan uh, uh, are going to be two things. And I think this time around, there'll be a lot more uh, enthusiasm and participation and, and citizens will be alert to uh, various policies. And second is also the, uh, the local bodies in place and particularly around Chennai, uh, though they are maybe called town Banjayats that they could be as well uh, in urban place. Now, it's, it's, it's a very important question in terms of uh, both participation of the local body and also as an implementing agency at the last mile of the plan. Um, but one of the biggest handicaps has been the capacity of local bodies in terms of managing uh, not just plans, even civic issues. So it's been, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in fact, of the Niti Ayog's recent document has been sort of pointing out to this as to what is the capacity of local bodies to engage with the uh, with urban planning issues. And there is a, a huge capacity building program put in place. So uh, the, uh, the, the uh, councillors uh, or the Punjab uh, representatives can meaningfully uh, sort of know what's happening and engage. That's the first point. So it requires certain kind of capacity building. Second, I think it's a very important point Anand has raised is in terms of revenues. You know, what is the revenue base of the various local bodies? You see in the case of Chennai CMTA, uh, can put the plan in place uh, and certain projects have to be developed by um, interstate uh, uh, agencies, you know, uh, while some can be done only at the local body level. Uh, so uh, what is the revenue base for these projects? 
because one of the biggest problems that have been in planning is the gap between proposals and investment. And uh, if uh, and given the fact that the uh, property tax for Chennai has not been revised for many years, and uh, which has been an important uh, source of revenue, and also a source of revenue for other local bodies around, how do you capture land? And uh, we are not increasing the property tax. We are not doing betterment charges. Octra has been abolished. So what is the source of revenue? So how do you capture? Uh, because property prices increase not by themselves. It increases only because of investment and development made by the state. And local bodies do put money in terms of certain everyday civic and other development things. So how can local bodies access this revenue? So one of the biggest tools, the popular tools across the city, uh, for the matter country, has been the premium FSI. But the premium FSI, I don't know what is the devolution in terms of the uh, revenue going to local bodies. Uh, so, you know, uh, so there are uh, la larger capacity issues, uh, resource issues and revenue issues. Uh, and I'm sure if the MPC, if it, if it gets active, uh, I'm sure that is one way to, uh, one way to sort of uh, uh, bring in participation. Thank you. Um, quite a few more comments uh, and questions in the chat box. So the uh, next one from Mr. Kabilan is that electric vehicles, cars and two wheelers are getting more attention, which paves way for congestion. Should we include guidelines and restrictions for increased uh, private vehicles? Uh, thoughts from either of you? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, from we at ITDP, we believe that when we, it is important for us to look at how we can have clean transport in our cities, but um, there is import, there's, uh, a need for us to prioritize, especially when it comes to government um, funding uh, or incentives for the same. And as a result, uh, when you do speak about, you know, what should be the policy, we ideally believe that we should look at electrifying public transportation followed by shared mobility. Um, so auto rickshaws, shared auto rickshaws, they do cater to large uh, parts of our um, citizens. So prioritizing electrification of shared mobility, and then really looking at um, electrification uh, or electrified micro mobility as well. Cities across the uh, world are also looking at electric cycles, et cetera, to help maybe you know even vulnerable people like uh, older, uh, members of our citizen groups who can uh, use this and travel to lo longer distances as well. So we uh, you know, definitely believe that there should be a priority to the incentives that you do provide um, to the private sector for electrification and, uh, and definitely look at cars and two-wheelers with a separate or different lens. But yeah, Sri Vatsan, if you had something to add on having guidelines and restrictions in the master plan, what are your thoughts? So uh, I, I think uh, this is a larger policy matter in terms of how do you support uh, this thing. And I think few things can be kept out of the master plan. It, it, this is a sort of a state level issue it has to be dealt at that level. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think there are uh, electric mobility policies that the states are adopting. And maybe that's the place where we need to look at this prioritization. Uh, true. I think uh, we the Tamil Nadu already has its electric vehicle uh, policy, which came out in 2019, and there is a substantial effort there to boost a manufacturer of EV uh, vehicles, right, giving them uh, subsidies and so on. Uh, also, as an industry, and no doubt as uh, you know, looking at potentially jobs uh, in that space. But I think uh, one of the arguments that I've been hearing around EV. Um, slightly sidetracking here, but uh, is that, um, so this was a, a national webinar uh, organized by CSC and their perspective was that uh, we should promote EV um, in the private vehicle space because uh, while 
on one side, the argument is you're just pushing the point of uh, source pollution to elsewhere. You're still getting coal powered, um, you know, electricity in India largely. Uh, it would be easier, they said, to manage and regulate uh, at that point at the source rather than you know all the various exhaust pipes uh, out there on the road. So that was one argument. Um, I'm just putting it out there for people to chew over, uh, not that we need to get into it right now. Um, there's also, I'm sorry, did somebody have a comment, uh, want to speak? Otherwise I can continue going through the comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, yeah, so Santosh here from ITDP. I just wanted to add one point with respect to electrification. Yeah, please, Santosh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the thing is, uh, in many states, whichever has an EV policy, it's largely uh, done in the interest of manufacturers. It's very, uh, it's hardly looked at from the perspective of mobility itself. Um, and uh, in terms of mobility, electric vehicles will have an impact, in the, especially in terms of uh, charging infrastructure. And uh, uh, if it's let in the hands of the manufacturer, they would sort of take over the street space for electric charging as well. So, which would sort of have a very big impact on um, the urban fabric, especially with respect to mobility. The eventual idea is that uh, electric car is still a car. It's going to take the same amount of space on the roads as a normal car does. But if charging also comes into the picture, they will occupy that much space uh, even longer. Uh, so, I think it's important that we consider as part of the third master plan, how we integrate charging facilities as well. Ideally, it's best they kept on off-street uh, such as rather than on street itself. That's something I want to add. Thank you. Yes, a very valid point. Um, I think currently EVs being looked only in terms of the pollution perspective, uh, but not in terms of how it's going to congest our streets and also the space it will take up uh, on street. And uh, what what it, how the impact will be on parking. Uh, not to mention our uh, infrastructure for electricity as well. So those are those are huge issues that one would need to look at as well. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, just scrolling back to the comments. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Anandakrishnan has also added that bicycles too are underexploited with cheap hiring schemes that rely on elegant quick access model uh, models rather than high-tech options mimicking Western models. A tough road ahead where we need robust citizen engagement with elected representatives and media. Absolutely. And I think now that our urban uh, elect, uh, local body elections have happened after a very long time in Chennai, uh, let's hope that we have more engagement with the uh, councillors and with the mayor and you know uh, that that becomes a more vibrant space. Um, Vastuk Chaurasia also says that is metro rail development apart from tier one cities important to increase the ridership because the heritage cities like Chennai and Madurai may suffer due to the elevated uh, metro corridors? What is your opinion? So, Sumana, um, just quickly out here. So, the thing is, um, metro probably has a role to play, but like I was also highlighting in the presentation that currently buses do take way more people than metro. And as we look at a much, you know, a, a much more expanded cities, maybe we should focus on uh, bus based um, public transport, which is fast and rapid uh, and reliable um, as well. So I would, you know, agree with Vasuk Chaurasia that as the city expands, it might be better for it to focus on bus based public transportation um, as against expanding metro uh, largely. Thank you. And um... And then we have uh, Sauvik Chaudhary who says, Mumbai received a backlash on introducing TOD measures that reduce parking requirement near mass transit modes by adding FSI in those zones. The DP 2035 of Mumbai was changed to revert back to the old ways after the suggestions objections round. Your comment on what should be done after a visible error on parking emphasis on Sorry, I'm just trying to. What should be done after a visible error on parking emphasis gets sanctioned 
after due process of increasing the number of MLCPs. Um, Chawik, if you're uh, on, you can just ask your question because I'm not sure if I'm reading it right. Okay, I'm just gonna continue with the comments and then if Savik wants to um, jump in, we'll have that. Uh, there's also a suggestion from Mr. Krishnamurti that at staggered junction uh, traffic signals, uh, you know, at staggered junctions, traffic signals should be relocated to stop road users from using the wrong lanes. And then from the group TNSTC enthusiasts, um, there is a question on how can we improve public bus transit other than bus priority lanes and by increasing the fleet. Uh, we know that the government is planning to procure e-buses soon uh, for Chennai and tier two cities. So how do we increase, uh, you know, what other things do we do other than the bus priority lanes and fleet increase? Ashwati? Yeah, so Mana, so um, yeah, one, I of course, you know, if you don't have buses, then you're going to be stuck, stuck with that. So definitely the fleet and looking at how buses can move faster as well. But I think there are a whole host of other digital solutions as well. So, uh, you know, maybe making sure that you have a single card to travel between your bus, suburban rail, metro, etc. would make sure that your experience of using different modes across the city is uh, seamless we could uh, there are you know other issues when you also look at for example how public transport needs to be improved when you have the lens of uh, maybe women or children and their caregivers so making sure that you have access to even facilities that is essential for them in terms of toilets or um, uh, feeding rooms at the uh, at terminals, uh, etc. So those are other things that can be done, which helps these, uh, you know, uh, sort of these more vulnerable groups as well. Uh, making sure that information is readily available, uh, both in static but also in like in digital ways. Knowing when your bus will arrive. Um, next would would I'm sure help our citizens greatly. So I think while these are while maybe getting the fleet and ensuring that buses do have lanes for them to travel faster are the larger sort of goals that we might want to ensure that we bring in e-buses as well. There are a whole host of digital information payment related um, ways uh, or improvements that we can embrace to make the entire service uh, a lot more comfortable, safe and convenient for our users. Absolutely, uh, very crucial because um, that will make, you know, encourage more people to use uh, public transit uh, once we make it much easier to do so. At my point, I'd like to add a point here. You see, yes, uh, see the, within the city, you have a fairly dense place. So there is, a, uh, you know, and it's a, it is quite a well-developed bus network. So the density of development and usage of bus has a positive correlation. So when you come to suburbs, it's uh, very dispersed. And uh, there's not enough density and there is not enough road network. So, you know, it's not just putting more buses. It's also something like where you have dense clusters of development. Uh, and also to understand that, um, uh, you know, where are the affordable houses? Where do people who work and where do they live? Uh, and most of the middle class and, uh, uh, live outside, far outside, where there is hardly any bus connection. So I think I tend to focus more on the periphery. That's where that's where the problem is, and that's where also the potential is. And uh, this all the future growth is going to happen substantially in the peri-urban areas. So if you don't plan for the peri-urban areas, um, no point continuously investing in a city which is already dense and fairly well developed. I think that's the issue here. Yes, thank you. Definitely. Um, those are the growing areas and we need to make sure we plan for them as well. Um, next comment. Um, if, so um, there's one from uh, Facebook Live uh, for Ashwati. 
um, is saying that uh, Vinish uh, Vidya Dharan says that uh, he didn't un quite uh, comprehend the alternatives on multi-level parking that you mentioned. So Ashwati, could you just touch on that, please? So, so Sumana, uh, you know, I can give you uh, and Vinish like to you a very live example from our city. So we have a multi-level car park that we planned in the heart of Chennai in uh, pedestrian plaza or or Pondi Bazaar, uh, which is largely pedestrian. But the problem is that nobody uses the multi-level car park, even though it it is there, bang in on that road. People choose to park on our streets and or even on the side roads. So, so what I'm trying to say is that you do think that we can reduce our or we can. Um, you know, reduce the problems related to parking by creating more multi-level car parks. Uh, that's not going to happen. And we've seen that in many cities like Bombay and Bangalore, where we've had these articles called ghost stories, which is you create the MLCP, but people are not accessing it. Um, or unless and until there is a heavy fine um, enforced in an uh, area around it to make people use this multi-level car park. So instead of creating multi-level car parks, provide increasing the pricing of parking on street itself can help you reduce um, the parking demand on our streets. And that's what cities like London, for example, have done. So they increase price of the parking to a level where they begin to notice that at least about 20 to 30% of the parking slots on the road remain available for other users as well. So um, yeah, multi-level car park will not solve the issue and pricing parking is uh, the solution that we need to embrace. Thank you, yes. And like, like you mentioned, we are charging like 10 rupees, 20 rupees, which is really nothing for parking. Um, and often not even that. So there's a lot of uh, problem there. And then uh, we have a comment from Mr. Krishnamurti that Sidewalks need to be maintained properly so that pedestrians can walk without fear and hawkers must be banned at any cost. So I, I think I just want to quickly comment on the second part of that, that uh, one, um, I think there would, that's a point of debate because uh, hawkers are recognized by law as, uh, you know, having the right to use that space. The question of course is how do we ensure that their livelihood is not impacted while at the same time, they do not uh, block pedestrian movement. And it's, you know, in many places recognized that they are also form a sort of eyes on the street and make, you know, you feel safer in that space when you walk, knowing that there's somebody there in a pinch who might be able to help you if you have a situation. So I think that's that would be a point that um, there may not be that much agreement, but I uh, just wanted to put it out there. Uh, then there's a comment from Tripti that Kerala has uh, planned to set up solar power public charging stations, which seems to be a good step. So I think this also links back to what Santosh had pointed out. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there since we had that conversation and we're kind of running a little out of time and I want to try and make uh, go through pretty much as much as we can here. Um, then there's a comment that as pointed out by Ashwati, the utilization of the metros one seventh of what was, you know, projected, uh, which is, you know, in view of poor connectivity. And the question is whether the implementation of monorails will be the solution. Well, now, unfortunately, I'd like to say no. <laughs> monorails haven't been successful across, uh, you know, cities across the world. So, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, monorails are not going to solve the issue. I think we do have a good network of suburban rail, metro, and MRTS. And if we, uh, like uh, Srivatsan also said, focus on buses in, in the periphery areas, um, connecting the work centers to where our people are actually living would be a great way to look at. And as we are creating these new networks of streets, if we can find the space for making sure that these uh, buses can travel in their own lanes, uh, that would make sure that they, people are able to also access their destinations quicker at a much lower cost for the government as well. And as a result, create a much wider network. I would just add that not to rush, it's a bit too early to judge the metro because the length is 
very limited. It's uh, it runs on very few select lanes, so you'll have to look at it, a large network of more than 200 to 300 kilometers to really, uh, you know, see its impact. Uh, because it just runs on two corridors, which already has a very well developed road network and a bus transport running right above it. Uh, so we'll have to see when the city is uh, networked extensively. Intensely. Of course, there's a question about cost and priority, but I think it's a bit too early to judge the metro. And maybe if I could just add that in some of the routes where we do have metro, we also have an elevated maybe flyovers that, that, that currently we do see. So if we do want to prioritize our public transport, then on the same route, we should not have elevated flyovers. So uh, we should really allow our public transport to do its role. Right, absolutely. I think in Delhi and in other places, we saw how you needed a larger network before the metro became, you know, reasonably popular. Um, but at the same time, there is the issue of cost and, uh, you know, other things that we could do in the meantime to ensure that our public transit is, um, you know, better for everyone and, and you know, makes it easier for usage. Um, uh, so Mr. Anantakrishnan has also commented that Chennai also needs to review its approach to street vending, implementing policies that help livelihood vending with access while protecting the rights of the pedestrian to equitable pavement space use. A new plan must keep this at, as a core point. Absolutely. And then Arul Ratnam has said, what is the status of MPC, Metropolitan Planning Committee in Chennai? Are they going to be included in the master plan preparation? And do we need an active mobility plan bill for Tamil Nadu like Karnataka has one? Um, so I'm gonna put that out there for responses. For the active mobility bill, I think that would be a great way to go ahead. Um, so if the uh, state of Tamil Nadu could also, um, you know, inspired by Karnataka embrace um, an act uh, that really prioritizes the rights of uh, people uh, who are walking and cycling, I think that would do great for all the cities in the state. And uh, for the master plan, I'd pass it over to Sri Vatsan. I really don't believe in <clears throat> putting uh, an act on a committee to set a problem right. Okay, this only adds up to the list. I think the point is uh, what we do on the ground. Okay, so I would rather prefer to put my money and time on um, setting things on ground. And uh, I don't need, a, I, I mean, I this is my personal view, I don't need an act to do what I should be doing. So. That's one point, but what will be the role of MPC? And I'm sure if the MPC is uh, getting active, as we heard before, uh, that certainly will play a role in the master plan, I suppose, because I'm sure this time around, the process of planning appears to getting better than the previous plans, because there is more out in the public domain. There's a concerted effort there. Uh, of course, we have to wait and watch as it rolls. So I think this will be, uh, better than the previous processes in terms of consultation, or better we don't know yet. Uh, so if the MPC is active, because it has to be reconstituted with all the new members, etc., uh, I'm sure, I, I hope uh, that it will uh, sort of uh, participate in the process. Right, thank you. And we're uh, down to the last couple of comments and then we will uh, hope we should close on time. Um, so there was one comment from Mr. Krishnamurti that even after the smart city implementation, the, he's talking about the pedestrian plaza in Tinagar, uh, parking of two wheelers still continue in the pedestrian plaza. And then there's a question um, about, does the master plan have uh, any plans to utilize the vacant spaces and MRTS stations as a source for non-fair revenue? So that's our last set of comments and questions. I think I can take the one on the pedestrian. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, Krishnamurti, so you know, when we were actually in the when the city was implementing the pedestrian plaza, there was it was it was full of uh, parking, and over these last couple of years, the amount of two-wheeler parking has reduced dramatically. 
of course there is uh, still uh, improvement that can uh, be that can definitely happen and i feel with uh, better enforcement of parking uh, in in streets across the city we can definitely embrace that and this is something that we need to do not only in tinagar but also in parts across because wherever we have footpaths we do notice that either two wheelers or four wheelers tend to be parked and people do not respect the needs of a pedestrian or a, uh, or a cyclist so hence um parking and its enforcement is critical for that and i think it will take some time so you know the, the certain things we do need to give time and maybe with time we will know about uh, how it can be improved thanks ashwati and um the comment on the um mrts station uh space usage would either of you want to respond to that does the master plan have any plans to utilize the vacant spaces in the mrts station as a source for non fair revenue no, i don't think it's a master plan issue i think it's a project issue and uh, since uh, mmd cmd is involved in the mrts and and i believe that there is a long term plan to integrate mrts and metro into one uh i i, I think it's a more a project question and it's up to the institution to look at it i don't i i this is what i uh, i think it is right thank you so i think uh, we're at the end of the of our time as well and uh, questions and comments as well um so uh, if if people have any other comments or questions you can you know drop us a mail and uh, we will uh, get in touch with our speakers and uh, get some response from them Uh, so feel free to drop us a mail if you have anything further you want to say and uh, with that uh, let me just thank uh, both of our speakers professor Pre shrivatsan and ashwati for taking time off today and joining us and sharing uh, you know uh, a small part of their vast knowledge with us today and giving us these insights into uh, the city planning and also on how uh transportation the scenario looks today and where we'd like to go and what we should be looking forward to in the years to come so thank you both very much for agreeing to join us today and taking this time and thank you to all the participants for uh, signing up joining in and for all your animated comments and conversation we hope it was interesting and please do feel free to drop us a line uh with your feedback comments inputs and finally thank you to all my colleagues at cag for helping me put this together and get making this possible today thank you everyone good thank evening you. bye thank bye. you um, so